Britain's supposed bastion of liberalism, The Guardian newspaper, is in the middle of picking a new editor-in-chief. It comes after allegations from insiders that its journalism is being bought by advertisers. So has the Pulitzer Prize it won for the Snowden revelations gone to its head after its fracas with the Cameron government? Does it now look to Washington for its spin on world events? Former Guardian contributor Nafiz Ahmed had his contract terminated after his perspectives clashed with the paper's editorial perspectives. He is currently crowdfunding via Patreon.com for a new media platform in Surge. And he joins me now. Welcome to Fees. The hunt is on for the new editor-in-chief of The Guardian. It's owned by the Scott Trust. Alan Rusbridge has left his job at The Guardian to become the head of the Scott Trust. So is he still the boss? Well, he will effectively be the boss. I mean, the Scott Trust is the uh, the body which owns and governs The Guardian and which is, was set up in the 1930s to essentially protect The Guardian's financial and editorial independence. That was the idea. Um, so Alan Rusbridge's job as, the, as part of the Scott Trust won't be to be involved in the day-to-day -day editorial decisions, but clearly the overall direction of The Guardian is going to be decided by the people who run the trust. So that will include Russ Bridger. And it will also include uh, many powerful people who are very plugged into the uh, international finance community. Finance people. community? Yes. Surely the muckraking journalist community that uh, began The Guardian, people like C.P. Scott or whatever. Well, unfortunately, uh, in 2008, the Scott Trust uh, the structure of the Scott Trust was changed, and uh, even though it was an, it was a, set up as a non-charitable trust before, in 2008 they changed it into a limited company. So even though it's called the Scott Trust, it's actually the Scott Trust Limited. So it runs pretty much like any other limited company. It has to be a profit-making company. The only difference really is the profits don't go to shareholders who, who are there trying to make money for themselves. The, the profits will go back into the, the, the people who are executives of the Scott Trust are the shareholders. This, is, this explains and something about why the financial coverage sometimes, which has been very good, certainly in the run-up mm. to the crisis, people from Guardian Media Group, which is owned by the Scott Trust, yes. which will be coming out with neoliberal pro-city stuff. Yes, so, so if you look at the people who are on the board of the Scott Trust and the Guardian Media Group, many of them represent what we, you, anyone would look at them and say, these are, these are the elites of British society, whether it's banking, finance, uh, the political elite. So it wouldn't be, I would say, facetious to kind of question um, you know, whether the Scott Trust and, and the kind of ideological mindset of the people who run it will in some way have a structural constraint Chinese on the way the Guardian walls. operates. The first thing <laughs> any of the various editors of the Guardian uh, and its uh, offices around the world and bureaus would say is there are complete walls. Well, the thing is, is that these things work in a structural way. Um, and stories can be pulled in a direct way. And sometimes it can happen in... in um, it can, it can happen indirectly as well in terms of self-censorship and knowing what editors like and don't like to see. And in fact, uh, myself as a journalist, and, and as, as you probably are aware, but many journalists have spoken uh, about how you know, you've been working in the, uh, you know, you've been developing a career over 20 years and you start off uh, with very, very, very excited to do big stories and then you kind of pitch them. And um, you kind of gauge the reaction of your editors and eventually you start to realize that there are certain subjects and certain headlines that the editors will kind of scoff at or say, well, no, you maybe need to change it. And it becomes such an uphill struggle to pursue those kind of things that they end up stop, they, they'll get to a point where they won't even pitch those ideas because they know that they won't have traction. And that's not even because the editor is necessarily himself engaged in a conspiracy, but because the editor himself has probably gone through that process of having to deal with these structures and these kind of invisible walls and, and navigating them and knows what will wash and what won't wash and what will get him into trouble as an editor and what won't. And ultimately, of course, it's, this, it's the editor-in-chief that will be answerable to the GMG, the executives on there, and answerable to, um, and they will be answerable to the people in, in, in charge at, at the Scott Trust. Okay, well, so, I, so I, there will be at that level direct communications about what well, you know we didn't like that story and you need to make sure stuff like that isn't running again or things so that that kind of conversation without a doubt will be happening i but should declare an interest because i started my career on the guardian tell me about your story on the guardian um, mine was with peter preston this was under Rusbridger. what happened to you so my experience i felt was was quite extraordinary because it wasn't even a case of advertising revenue or that kind of thing. I wrote um, for the environment section of The Guardian and I was commissioned to write about the geopolitics of environmental energy and economic crises, how it all fit together. 
Um, so, you know, I was there for about just over a year and I was writing about stuff going on in Syria, Iraq, um, various other geopolitical situations, even Ukraine, looking at the role of energy and economics. So um, I, when uh, Israel went into Gaza um, in Operation Protective Edge, I did a, a kind of investigative piece exposing, following up some work I'd done previously, exposing the interests of um, Israel in uh, getting control of the Gaza Marine, where there is untapped gas resources in the occupied territories, um, which could produce a revenue of around six to eight billion dollars a year. Okay, great, great story. Uh, nothing controversial as terms of the Guardian editorial line, maybe, maybe compared to recent editorial lines. What went wrong? Why didn't they like it? It's a good story. So, I mean, what was interesting about this was the way, it the way in which The Guardian responded to the publication of my piece. Now, under my contract, I had editorial control over what I wrote, and I actually would publish straight to the website. Um, so, after posting this article, um, I was told by, I literally got a call the following day from one of the senior editors mm. uh, on the environment site, and they said to me that, this is not a proper environment story. Um, you shouldn't have been, you shouldn't be posting this, and we are going to discontinue your blog and we're going to terminate your contract. And it was just so sudden, and and it was obviously for me quite a shocking experience, and 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 coming out of the blue in that way, um, really not clear how what to make of it, and I wasn't given any opportunity to kind of have a discussion about it or. But they did. The Guardian covered Gaza in great detail, and the carnage, and the thousands of uh, men, women and children who lost their lives, didn't it? Well, it did. I mean, certainly I would say that the Guardian's coverage of what was going on in occupied territories was, was, was better than um, most of the other British press. I mean, or is it the geopolitics? Well, it's difficult to say what was, what was it about this piece that was... That, that, I mean, for me, the, the issue that this was not an environment story didn't wash. This was an excuse. I mean, I, this was my beat. This is what I was, I've been writing about. So, so that was not a really a good reason. So I was struggling to think, what was it about this that kind of really... And so that, you know, when, when, I, when I went public with the whole story, and, um, I was backed up by um, a couple of people from The Guardian. On, on the one hand, Jonathan Cook, who is a former uh, Middle East correspondent, staff writer, you know, foreign editor, for many Imagine. years at The Guardian, yes. He, he came out and backed me up and said that what happened to me kind of chimed with his experience at The Guardian and, and editorial problems that he had faced there. Um, and he had said that, he, in his experience, that there were, these in, there were these invisible walls at The Guardian, especially on issues like Israel-Palestine. And he actually said that there, were a num there was a culture at The Guardian, he said, where certain types of questions about Israel shouldn't be asked. Israel, questions which really challenge the legitimacy of the existing state of affairs, where we have questions about, for example, Israeli apartheid, questions about um, Israel's financial interests and, and, the, and kind of the insidious relationships that Israel has with Western governments and that kind of level of complicity where Western governments are uh, kind of allowing these kind of crimes to take place. And yet people, I mean, if we move it on to other newspapers now, many people will say The Guardian is considered the most uh, anti-Zionist of all, all the different papers. Let's just, I mean, who is yeah. going to replace Rutherford then? Someone who might change the culture you were just describing? Well, I don't know. I mean, so we have this, we have a number of uh, candidates who, that, that has been publicized. Um, All with American uh, contacts. Emily Bell, Wolfgang Blau, Jadine Gibson. Gibson. Um, do you sense anything that's going to be pro-Washington in The Guardian? Well, I think there is definitely this sense in which, um, you know, over the last few years, Rusbridger has overseen this very big effort to enter into the American market. Um, but that's quite interesting, that whole process itself and revealing, because one of the uh, companies that has provided advertising support to the expansion of Guardian US is HSBC. Now, obviously, there was a big hullabaloo about how HSBC um, was, you know, involved in kind of scuppering the Telegraph's coverage and the Guardian was very smug about it. And then the Telegraph hit back with its own kind of exposés of how the Guardian is scuppering its own journalism. I and mean, it became a bit of a joke, a bit of a Over fuss. Over Apple spat. advertising. Yeah. I mean, and, I mean, you know, it's difficult to say in that context of this spat between media empires who really is telling the truth and who is not. I mean, it seemed to me that, this, that there was some 
uh, there was definitely some, uh, some basis to the Telegraph's claims about the Guardian, even if maybe perhaps there was some hyperbole there. So we're talking here about some of our main uh, non-tabloid newspapers. If those are so, um, so swung by uh, oligarchs, oligarchs connected to the State Department, big city interests, what hope do we have uh, ahead of the general election when uh, usually we say Rupert Murdoch wins the election? Well, you know, I think, you know, Rupert Murdoch probably still has a good chance of winning the election. But I think now what we're seeing is that this is, is effectively the battle of the oligarchs, where we've got various different media interests, some better than others. And there's no doubt, despite my bad experience of The Guardian, I, I, st I still do think that The Guardian coverage of, of many issues is slightly better than elsewhere. However, that would it would it to kind of ignore the fact that the Guardian still has isn't deeply involved in many very much of the same types of problems advertising issues financial pressures these structural and ideological issues really kind of makes you ask questions as to whether it's it's very different and, and or, or is it really kind of very much involved in the same kinds of problems that much of the press and so I do think coming up to the general elections there is this problem where most of our, our, our media, in fact, I would say all of our, our mainstream media, um, is tied into these interests. Naveez Ahmed, thank you. Thank you.